Good evening. Good evening. Well, welcome to our service of worship at Moments Orthodox Presbyterian Church in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Uh, just one announcement, and that is that the special offering for tonight is actually for Reform Mission Services, as it says on the back of the bulletin, uh, not for Back to God Ministries. That's next, that's next week. Mm -hmm. That's next week. Yeah, that's Back to God Week, uh, Back to God Ministries is next week's offering. <clears throat> Let us now prepare our hearts and minds for the worshiping of the living God with silent prayer. Psalm 34. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. O oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be in our midst this evening. Please turn with me in the Psalter hymnal to number 95C, now with joyful exultation, 95C.
the back of the Psalter Hymnal to page 946, where we find questions 60 and 61 of the larger catechism. The light of nature <clears throat> is not sufficient for salvation, even if they try to frame their lives according to the truth that is in the light of nature, because it has no solution to the sin problem. On the flip side of that, not all those who hear special revelation are saved, but only those who are true members of the visible church. So let's confess our faith together with these two questions. Can they who have never heard the gospel, and so know not Jesus Christ, nor believe in him, be saved by their living according to the light of nature? They who, having never heard the gospel, know not Jesus Christ, and believe not in him, cannot be saved, be they never so diligent to frame their lives according to the light of nature, or the laws of that religion which they profess, Neither is there salvation in any other, but in Christ alone, who is the Savior only of his body, the church. Are all they saved who hear the gospel and live in the church? All that hear the gospel and live in the visible church are not saved, but they only who are true members of the church invisible. Whom did you dread and fear 
so that you lied and did not remember me, did not lay it to heart. Have I not held my peace even for a long time, and you do not fear me? I will declare your righteousness and your deeds, but they will not profit you. When you cry out, let your collection of idols deliver you. The wind will carry them all off, a breath will take them away. But he who takes refuge in me shall possess the land, and shall inherit my holy mountain. And it shall be said, Build up, build up, prepare the way, remove every obstruction from my people's way. But thus says the one who is high and lifted up, who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place, and also with him who is of a contrite and lowly spirit, to revive the spirit of the lowly and to revive the heart of the contrite. For I will not contend forever, nor will I always be angry. For the spirit would grow faint before me in the breath of life that I made. Because of the iniquity of his unjust gain, I was angry. I struck him. I hid my face and was angry. But he went on backsliding in the way of his own heart. I have seen his ways. But I will heal him. I will lead him and restore comfort to him and his mourners, creating the fruit of the lips. Peace. Peace to the far and to the near, says the Lord, and I will heal him. But the wicked are like the tossing sea, for it cannot be quiet, and its waters toss up mire and dirt. There is no peace, says my God, for the wicked. Let us come before our God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we have this day sanctified your name, held it up, as the only name under heaven by which we can be saved. We pray, Father, for the coming of your kingdom in its consummation. We pray, Father, for righteousness. We pray, Father, for holiness among ourselves and for those around us, too, that they would see and know that you are God and there is no other. We also implore you, Father, to give us our daily bread, trusting, Father, that you know what is needful for us, and you give us those things as we do need them. We ask, Father, that you would keep deception and falsehood as a way of personal gain far from us, we ask, Father, for neither poverty nor riches, but satisfy us with the bread you have ordained for us, our manna. We do not wish to deny you and say, who is the Lord? We do not wish to forget you. We do not wish to live as practical atheists, as if we did not live before the very face of your holiness. <laughs> Forgive us, Father, whenever we pray selfishly, asking only for ourselves. Help us to pray for the needs of others. Help us to walk with righteousness. Help us to fight in that spiritual battle against Satan's kingdom. Help us, Father, not to make this world our ultimate destination, but to remember the inheritance that is laid up in heaven for us, incorruptible, unfading, undefiled, an inheritance to which we have the right by that seed that your word has planted in our hearts in which we ask for growth to happen and fruit to be made manifest that it may be also that we would have fruit on our labors and the work of our hands to be content not only with what we have but to strive for your kingdom and its righteousness first above all things, and not to worry, 
not to worry about tomorrow and what it brings, but to be content and to rest in your sovereignty, to rest in your unfailing and unchanging benevolence towards your adopted children. Father, we ask that you will bless what you have given to us and that we will use those resources wisely, whether it be our time or our substance, our relationships. We thank you for them and ask for your blessing to be upon them. We ask for your blessing to be upon us as we seek to carry out your will that you have revealed in your scriptures to follow your ways, to be your disciples, to learn more about you in your word, and to tell others about that truth as well. We thank you for the opportunity to worship you that we have tonight. And we pray that you will indeed be glorified and that we will be your people and you will be our God. We pray these things in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Please turn with me to hymn number 566, Fear Not, O Little Flock. We'll stand and sing together 566.
I invite you to turn to 1 Samuel chapter 21, which you can find on page 288 in the Church Bible. 1 Samuel chapter 21, we'll be reading the first nine verses. Hear now God's holy, inspired, and inerrant word. Then David came to Nov, to Ahimelech the priest. And Ahimelech came to meet David, trembling, and said to him, Why are you alone, and no one with you? David said to Ahimelech the priest, The king has charged me with the matter, and said to me, Let no one know anything of the matter about which I send you, and with which I have charged you. I have made an appointment with the young men for such and such a place. Now then, what do you have on hand? Give me five loaves of bread, or whatever is here. And the priest answered David, I have no common bread on hand, but there is holy bread, if the young men have kept themselves from women. And David answered the priest, Truly women have been kept from us as always when I go on an expedition. The vessels of the young men are holy, even when it is an ordinary journey. How much more today will their vessels be holy? So the priest gave him the holy bread, for there was no bread there but the bread of the presence, which is removed from before the Lord to be replaced by hot bread on the day it is taken away. Now a certain man of the servants of Saul was there that day, detained before the Lord. His name was Doeg the Edomite, the chief of Saul's herdsmen. Then David said to Ahimelech, Then have you not here a spear or a sword at hand? For I have brought neither my sword nor my weapons with me, because the king's business required haste. The priest said, The sword of Goliath the Philistine, whom you struck down in the valley of Elah, behold, it is here, wrapped in a cloth behind the ephod. If you will take that, take it, for there is none but that here. And David said, There is none like that. Give it to me. Now, one of the most amazing things about the Christian life is that God provides for his people even when they are thumbing their nose at God. It seems difficult for us to master the concept in our own minds that flies are more attracted by honey than vinegar. We would prefer to stick it to people who disagree with us, crush them, we think. Put down anyone who insults us or harms us. But you know, this passage shows us the enormous patience of God, doesn't it? David is improving his skills about lying and deceives Ahimelech, which deception eventually results in the death of Ahimelech, along with all the other priests at Nov. And yet God is still providing his holy daily bread for David. Therefore, this passage should be a great encouragement to us. When David came to know, word had apparently arrived ahead of time that David was on the outs with Saul. This appears to be part of the reason Ahimelech is trembling when he comes out to meet David. And we should note that fear seems to motivate several characters in this chapter. And when David appears, initially he is alone. Ahimelech knows this is very strange because David is a commander of soldiers. Where are the soldiers? If David was on a military mission, he would have a whole troop of soldiers with him. Ahimelech would then have known everything was normal. But maybe Ahimelech had fallen foul of Saul just as much as David had and was afraid David was sent on a mission to kill him. But it was the lack of a military escort that really had Ahimelech worried. If David was on the outs with Saul, it would be perilous indeed for Ahimelech to help David in any way. David has to explain why there are no soldiers initially with him in order to procure Ahimelech's help. And his explanation, of course, is at least partially a lie. Saul would certainly not charge David with a matter telling him to tell no one else. That was pure fabrication. And that lie will cost Ahimelech his life later in the chapter because Ahimelech is fooled into thinking that David and Saul were on 
good terms. And that it would therefore be safe for him to help David. David should have told Ahimelech the truth and then let Ahimelech decide whether or not to help David. But there is a part of what David says that is not a lie, and that is that David does, in fact, have some people with him, some young men with him. They just didn't appear with him at the time. But Jesus makes it very plain in his account of the matter in Mark chapter 2, verse 25, when he says, he and those who were with him. So there were young men with David, even though that is not entirely clear from the text itself. Jesus makes it clear. As Richard Phillips notes, this lie of David's has a parallel in ministry today. Phillips says, I have learned in pastoral ministry that Christians who are walking closely with the Lord come to see their pastors seeking prayer and counsel before an important decision. Christians who are pulling away from the Lord usually conceal their plans and afterward see their pastor seeking forgiveness for actions that they knew were wrong all along. Of course, Phillips doesn't mean that every decision needs the counsel of the pastor before being implemented. That would be very strange. But really important decisions do usually benefit from getting counsel from other people, don't they? In a multitude of counselors, there is safety, says Proverbs. Now David has to get to the cave of Adullam before he starts to realize this, and before his temporary rebellion and flight from God starts to turn around. Well, David first requests food from Ahimelech. Ahimelech now assumes that there are, in fact, young men accompanying David, and since there were young men with David, maybe they now just came into view as David was talking. David now knows that he can trust Ahimelech. Now Ahimelech here knows a very important principle to which Jesus himself will give his stamp of approval in his discussion of this text. The young men just need to be ceremonially clean in order to eat the showbread. Normally, of course, only priests ate the showbread. But the principle Ahimelech knows and implements in this situation is this, that when principles of life or death become very immediate, then the ceremonial law must give way. This is true even if actual starvation is not the issue. Jesus will interpret this whole scene as a work of necessity that has a parallel in how the Sabbath should be observed. We pick this narrative up in Mark chapter 2, verse 23 and following. It's worth reading in full. One Sabbath he was going through the grain fields, and as they made their way, his disciples began to pluck heads of grain. The Pharisees were saying to him, Look, why are they doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? And he said to them, Have you never read what David did when he was in need and was hungry? He and those who were with him how he entered the house of God in the time of Abiathar the priest and ate the bread of the presence, which it is not lawful for any but the priest to eat, and also gave it to those who were with him. And he said to them, The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord, even of the Sabbath. So from Jesus' exposition of our text, we learn that works of necessity are lawful to do on the Sabbath. And the principle between the Sabbath and the showbread is the principle enunciated just earlier. When ceremonial law comes into conflict with a principle of necessity regarding life, the ceremonial law is the thing that bends. And that makes sense, given the fact that eating bread is a matter of the Sixth Commandment of the moral law. We are told there that we should not murder. That means that we should also promote life. And that is more important than a ceremonial observation. Now one thing that comes up 
in the discussion of this chapter is the ritual purity of the young men. Here we must be absolutely clear about what the scripture says and does not say. Ritual impurity does not imply moral sin. Not in and of itself. The only time it does imply moral sin is when the ritually impure person tries to do something that only a ritually clean person should be doing. A lot of people read a passage like this and come up with the idea that marital intimacy is somehow a bad thing. It's nothing of the sort. It is actually commanded by God in Genesis 1. So ritual impurity has to do with something else. In the Old Testament, it was the loss of any bodily fluid that made one ritually impure. So, cut yourself with a knife accidentally, and you start bleeding. That's hardly a morally objectionable thing if it was an accident, but it does make a person ritually unclean. The next segment of text introduces us to Doeg the Edomite, a man with as unclean a heart as we could possibly imagine. It is not known what is meant here uh, of, by his being detained before the Lord. Possibly he had a, a rash or something of his own that needed to be examined according to Levitical law. But at any rate, he was there and he heard this exchange between David and Ahimelech. And he later reported that incident to Saul. And this would result in the death of 85 priests at Nov. Doeg would have known the truth about David's situation. He would have known that Ahimelech thought everything was fine between Saul and David because of what David had said. Doeg is therefore a traitor of the worst possible sort because his treachery is covered with lies and with omissions of truth in such a way that Saul would get a very skewed view of what happened here. As the chief of Saul's herdsmen, he was a pastor of sorts, but obviously he was the sort that eats the sheep instead of tending them. The second request David makes after he requests food is for a weapon. And Achimelech tells David about the sword of Goliath. David asks for it because there is nothing like it. Problem is that if there is no sword quite like that, then it would have been quite obvious in Gath that this was David because he had Goliath's sword, and that was Goliath's hometown. Parading this sword around in Gath was not precisely the smartest thing David ever did. What we see here, then, is an amazing demonstration of God's care, despite the absolutely stupid decisions David makes in this chapter. David sins, and he is foolish. Of course, sin is also and always foolish, but David is being ruled here by fear, isn't he? And it's rather ironic here. He has... Great faith when facing the Philistines, even Goliath the giant. But when it comes to Saul, who never even had a prayer of defeating Goliath, since Saul fought like Goliath, but was considerably less imposing physically, David's more afraid of Saul than he is of Goliath. But that's what fear does to a person, isn't it? It makes them irrational. They get wrong in the head somehow. We saw a lot of irrationality during the COVID pandemic. People did extraordinary things because of fear, didn't they? I still see people wearing masks, though the danger is officially over. Everyone says so. We're out of the pandemic. People still wearing masks. Fear is one of the most powerful emotions. And scripture tells us that 
It can be a positive thing if it's directed at the right person. The fear of God. Jesus demonstrated the proper way to think about this during his arrest. He was not afraid of the people arresting him. Of course, we might think, but he is God. Why would he be afraid? Well, in Gethsemane, that's when we see Jesus as a man was very much afraid of taking on the wrath of God, which was about to hit him like a freight train. Demonstrates that we should also fear the wrath of God in such a way as to flee from it to the cross, where all craven fear is conquered, and where the triumph of Jesus over death takes away all remaining grounds of fear. But we just don't always follow the logic of that, do we? We're often like Peter when Jesus told him to come to him over the water. Peter walks on the water for a little while, but as soon as he takes his eyes off Jesus is when he starts to sink. And it's when those waves distract us from Jesus, and when we start to think that those waves are things that Jesus cannot control, that's when we start to sink. Fortunately, the answer for us is fairly simple, at least in one way, because it's the answer for most trials. <coughs> Either those we face from outside ourselves or when we are faced with the darkness within, and that answer is to look to the Lord Jesus Christ. Secondly, by way of application, we need to tell the truth. David must have thought he was protecting either himself, Ahimelech, or both. But that turned out to be false. And it was the lie that turned out to be deadly. God has a way of honoring the truth when we tell it, doesn't he? And the problem with David's lie was that it gave Doeg the excuse to paint Ahimelech as a traitor to Saul. And Saul being the person that he was, paranoid to the point of pathology, he was going to believe any story about someone opposed to him. Lastly, in trusting Jesus for our daily bread, because that's what David gets here, we need to be careful of two errors. The first is in thinking that God stops loving his children when they sin. We're often tempted to think we've really blown it this time. God can't forgive us. Or at the very least, it has become more difficult for God to forgive us than before. For the repentant Christian, and that word repentant is important, the thousandth time we fall into a particular sin is not any more difficult for God to forgive than the first time. We often think that is not the case because it's how we would think, isn't it? If someone sinned against us a thousand times in the exact same way, we would say we have the right for our patience to run out. But when we impose that kind of thinking on God, what we're really doing is denigrating the power of the blood of Christ to, fig to forgive sins. This is not how God thinks. And isn't it marvelously wonderful that he doesn't think the way we do on that? The equal and opposite error is for us to think that such vast capability of forgiveness on God's part gives us a free pass to sin whenever we want to. That's not the reason for God's patience and long-suffering and infinite ability to forgive. As we saw just a few weeks ago in Romans, <coughs> the reason for God's long-suffering is to lead people to repentance. 
That's the reason for the daily bread. The new holiness that we can have in Christ. It's the reason for the Spirit living inside us. And it's the reason for the forgiveness of sins that we have in Jesus Christ. So the Lord takes care of his children. He gives them their daily holy bread, the daily manna they need. He gives them the weapons they need to fight the spiritual warfare against Satan and against his kingdom. And his patience and long-suffering is designed to lead us to repentance. How many times have we experienced it? I know I have. When right after a sin, God does something amazingly kind to me, and I, I marvel at it. Why would God do that? Why didn't he just strike me dead? Because God doesn't think that way. Because the forgiveness of sins is there. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we're thankful for the forgiveness of sins and for your infinite patience towards us who sin in the same way many, many times. We thank you that your patience, because of the blood of Christ, will not run out for your children even though you might discipline us. That does not mean that your patience has run out. And it doesn't mean that your forgiveness has grown shorter. And so, Father, help us to repent once more when we do fall into that sin and turn away from it. Turn in repentance to you that your grace may be there. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I couldn't think of a better hymn to describe these ideas than number 305, Arise, my soul, arise. So let's stand and sing this hymn, 305.
and beyond any repayment of ours, your provision for us everlasting. And so we thank you, and we seek to express our thanksgiving in these tithes and offerings, which we request you would do, use for your work in the kingdom, to the glory and honor of your name. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. forevermore. 